Hello, welcome back to the channel. Right before I start, I would just like to say that the following story that I'm about to read was written by Jordan Grupe. Jordan Grupe is a horror author and YouTuber. I would highly recommend checking out Jordan's YouTube channel, Jordan Grupe Horror. There, you'll find many horror stories that Jordan has narrated that I'm sure will keep you entertained for hours. I would also recommend following Jordan on Reddit. His Reddit username is jgrupe. So thank you Jordan Grupe for allowing me to read your story. I appreciate it greatly. People sometimes ask me what it's like being a park ranger. I have to admit, it's a dream job for the most part. I work as a wilderness ranger and that means I get to go out by myself with little to no supervision. Wandering Yosemite National Park alone, I look for ways to restore nature to its proper state. I try to keep the park looking the way it's supposed to, pristine and beautiful just the way it has been since long before humans were around to disrupt it. If you ask me what I was looking for, I would be hard pressed to say it out loud. I just know it when I see it. The telltale signs of human activity which indicate a camping party had visited an area recently. People will often rearrange logs and rocks around a fire pit They'll leave trash lying around, half burnt sticks used for roasting marshmallows and other signs of their presence will be scattered about. Hand dug latrines, holes fill it with cigarette buds, and all sort of cruel words and phrases carved into trees. I've seen things that make my eyes water as a lover of nature and the untouched wilderness. My job is to correct their mistakes where possible returning the wilderness to its natural form so that the next person to come along doesn't have to shed a tear at the sight of the forest watching as it slowly deteriorates with each subsequent visit i think my job is vital and i hate to consider what this place might look like without people like me but every once in a while even someone as experienced as me can make a mistake and that's exactly what happened to me. I made a terrible mistake and now the wilderness I've always sought to protect has turned against me and I'm not sure if I'm going to get out of this alive. My uncle was the one who first told me about fairy rings. If you're ever walking through the forest and you stumble across a ring of mushrooms and it looks too perfect, don't touch it. He said to me once, those rings are made by fairies, and if you disturb them, they will come after you. You might have bad luck, or even worse, you could fall into their world and become trapped there. Uncle Ben had worked as a park ranger in his younger days, and he had lots of great stories about working at Yosemite National Park. Maybe that was partly why I wanted to get into this line of work. When I was younger, he told me and my older brother plenty of stories based in fact, but also quite a few that were based on folklore and legends, and some that he pulled it straight out of his ass. Those were usually the best ones, and often it was hard to tell the truth from fiction, at least for me. As I got older, I learned that many of the stories my Uncle Ben told me were fantastical lies, but I never held it against him. He made the world into a wild, hilarious and magical place for me from an early age. I remember he'd sing songs while playing his acoustic guitar around the campfire, making up the funniest lyrics I'd ever heard as he went along. To my young mind, it was like magic. Even if he was just replacing the lyrics to Candyman, with Candy Dog. To me, it was mind-blowing. Weird AI had nothing on my Uncle Bill, 
as far as I was concerned, and I'll never forget that feeling of walking through the forest with him, marveling as he explained the subtleties of nature and believing in all the hidden things he explained to me, real or not. Of course, as an adult, I didn't believe in magical things anymore. Fairy rings weren't made by fairies, they occurred naturally. Although there were competing theories on how they came about, I had learned in college that it was a biological process. There's plenty of folklore around these odd looking mushroom circles, but none of it is based in fact, or at least, I thought. But then all that changed. Recently, I came across a ring of mushrooms in the forest, looking far too perfect and organized. In the back of my mind, I recalled the advice of my uncle, but I no longer took it seriously. I reminded myself that he'd always loved to tell me tales of magic, fantastical things that didn't mean they were true, though. Once when I was a small child, we were out canoeing and I was getting tired and he had told me that if we just keep going on this particular lake there was a Kentucky Fried Chicken just up ahead I had pretended not to believe him but a little piece of 8 year old me had been genuinely curious if we would find the Coronel and his secret blend of herbs and spices located on a floating restaurant dock on the lake just around the next bend even though I didn't believe this ring of mushrooms was made by fairies, I didn't want to disturb it. It looked beautiful and surreal, all the way out here in the middle of the forest, and I just stood and admired it for several long moments. A sound came from behind me, startling me, and I spun around to see a deer in the woods. Just a little ways away, for some reason, I decided to take a picture of it and set my backpack down to take out my phone. I was looking down as I unzipped the bag and when I looked it back up again, I was shocked to see the deer was just a few feet away now, standing right in front of me. I backed it up instinctively and felt the large mushroom being crushed underfoot as I did so. The deer reared it up on its hind legs for a second and turned away disappearing into the trees again. My heart beating too fast, I looked down at the ring of mushrooms, now destroyed. What had been a complete circle was now a lazy arc with a mashed up pile of brown mush at one end. Shit, I said out loud, looking down at the gunk on my boot heel. I scraped the mush off my shoe on a nearby rock suddenly feeling nervous for reasons I couldn't understand. Why did I feel like I had broken some law or like I had gravely injured an innocent person? I hated disturbing nature in any way, hence my chosen profession. So I just chalked it up to feeling guilt over trampling the beautiful ring of mushrooms. Looking around the forest, I tried to ignore the feeling that now there were eyes watching me. Was Mother Nature silently judging me from all around? Or was it just my imagination? Sorry fairies, I muttered, picking up my backpack and moving on from the circle of mushrooms that was now a horseshoe of mushrooms and a brown splatter on one end. As I started moving again, I looked it up to see a storm was rolling in. There wasn't one predicted but the weather around this area could be random at times and it wasn't the first time the meteorologist had been wrong. I figured I should start heading back towards the ranger station so I turned around to go back the way I had come. There was no trail in this part of the forest. It was all navigated by landmarks and compass. I knew I had to head north and travel back up the slope and eventually I would find my way to the top of a ridge. From there I would make my way back down towards a hiking trail. The cliffs far off to the east would serve as a constant marker after that, once I was inside of them. 
I knew the park so well, I could picture it all in my mind's eye. Plenty of thick forest was in my way between here and there, but it was easy enough to navigate if you know how to keep a steady line. I started walking, picking up the pace when I heard a rumble of thunder heading my way. The storm was moving in very quickly, and a cold breeze rushed through my hair and chilled the back of my neck as if to confirm this. After 15 minutes of walking steadily uphill, the wind was picking up even further, causing branches to come crashing down from trees. The tall wooden columns stood swaying violently all around me, making me feel very nervous that something could fall on me from above. Weirdly, the ground began to slope downwards. That didn't seem right, so I paused for a second to check my compass, but it was missing from its usual spot where I attached it to my belt. Weird. It had only been 20 minutes prior. Reaching my other hand down to fill for my radio, I noticed with increasing panic that it was gone as well. My heart began to beat a little faster as I looked through my bag and all of my gear, trying to find two critical pieces of equipment. I never left the ranger station without either one. At least my phone was still in my pocket, although the reception out here was spotty. It gave me some reassurance in case of an emergency. I continued moving in what I thought was the right direction, hoping I was just remembering the landscape wrong. Maybe there was a valley before the ground sloped upwards again. I had been mistaken before about things like this, and usually I found the best course of action was just to go with my gut. The problem was, my gut wasn't sure anymore. I know this was the right way, but my eyes weren't matching my sense of direction. I checked at the moss on a nearby tree and saw it confirm it my internal compass. Still, feeling uneasy, I continued moving along, going deeper and deeper into this part of the forest, into what looked like a dark valley. As I walked, I began to see things that didn't make sense, plants that I had never seen before, mushrooms in various shades and colors, ranging from greens to reds, yellows and oranges. Even a few that were blue with yellow polka dots. I came upon three snowy white mushrooms that were so tall and broad. They were as big as a child. They stood at waist height and swayed as I approached as if aware of my presence. I had never seen anything like them and wondered if I had accidentally ingested some sort of hallucinogen when I stepped on that fairy ring. Or maybe, you fell into their world. Another voice in my mind said, sounding like Uncle Bill. No, it isn't possible, I muttered to myself. This isn't possible. The clouds above were turning black with approaching rain and that chilly breeze came again, running cold fingers through my hair. I spun around at the sound of movement behind me, terrified of what it could be. I reeled it back, my eyes wide and my heart pounding like a drum in my chest. There was no one behind me, but something was different. The trees had moved, several large firs were now blocking my way back completely, standing next to each other in a way that did not even remotely resemble the natural way in which trees grow. They were shoulder to shoulder, with no room for root growth or for light to come through. It occurred to me, after several moments, that there was only one thing that could have happened. The trees were moving. They were alive, and they were surrounding me, cutting off my escape. I spun around and ducked it away from the huge white swaying mushrooms, as they swiveled their huge caps turning like heads to watch me go. 
My legs feeling like jelly, I began to run faster than I'd ever run before. Racing through the forest, going deeper and deeper into this dark, uncanny valley. Birds called from the trees above me, their songs unfamiliar and strange. I began to see flowers and other plants that seemed to be watching me as well, just like the mushrooms and the trees. And I realized the forest was keenly aware of my presence. The trees were allowing me through, making a path for me as if this was the way they wanted me to go. I didn't know where I was running to, just that I needed to get away from those moving trees and the mushrooms that seemed to be watching me. But things were only getting stranger as I moved deeper into the forest. Finally, the ground leveled out and the trees parted completely to reveal a river inlet. The towering cliffs stood on either side of the water going straight up more than 100 feet on both sides. There was a hollow half log of driftwood floating on the water looking to me very much like a raft. I turned it around to see the trees had closed it in blocking my exit. There was only one way to go forward. Up above the skies were swirling in black. The rain began to pour down drenching me immediately as I climbed onto the log. I let my legs hang on either side and straddled it as the river began to swell. A few seconds later, I was drifting downstream on the buoyant log. It seemed like this whole area of the forest was one giant hive mind and it was guiding me somewhere. As I drifted along the stream, the current picked it up speed until it was a quickly rushing river. Rapids and whirlpools tossing me up and down and spun me around, sending the log tilting and tumbling over rocks and waterfalls. My legs scraped against the rocks and were cut on their sharp edges and several times I lost my grip on the slick wood in the rain and nearly went headlong into the rapids. The water began to calm slightly and I looked up to see there were now caves dotting the cliffs. Looking down on me from above, black holes poke marked the sheer vertical walls like doorways into the unenterable homes of creatures that dwell it impossibly there. There was no discernible way to get up to those dark entrances to the caves, and yet I saw multiple red glowing eyes looking out at me from each one. This forced my mind to imagine the type of creatures that would dwell in such a gravity-defying abode, and I imagined humanoid chameleons, giant lizardmen who scaled the smooth vertical walls of granite, climbing the stone as if they had suction cups attached to their hands and feet. Shuddering at this mental image, I just hoped that these creatures weren't hungry, and that they wouldn't decide to come down to the river to greet me. Their glaring eyes watching me as I drifted along, and I was so distracted by them that I didn't even notice the gravel shoreline coming up. Unprepared, my momentum threw me from the log and I went tumbling into the rocky shore. I stood and looked up to see I was just outside a large cave. It stood before me ominously and I heard strange noises coming from inside. This made me curious and I found myself taking tentative steps into the cave. As my eyes adjusted, I saw that there were steps leading down, carved into the rock. The wet stone dripped with moisture, cold wet landing on my head and my hands occasionally. It was just pouring outside and it was nice to be out of the rain, although I was still more than a little frightened. They'll want your eyes. A voice said from the shadows, causing me to jump. Who's there? I yelped. Just one will suffice, but if one is better than the other, you'd best give them that one and not the other. I spun around at the sound, looking for the source of it. Down here, it said. 
and I look it to see a small rabbit. Its eyes were red, its fur white, and albino. What did you say? How are you, how are you talking? You're a rabbit, I objected, as if this were the least sensible thing to happen to me all day. No time for this. The longer you stay here, the more you're going to lose. Don't ask questions. Just do as I tell you. The bunny was as insistent as it was cute. I was reminded a bit of the rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. The comparison seemed very apt at this moment. I just hoped the rabbit could lead me out of here. Okay, I said. I'll trust you. Good, the rabbit said. Listen closely. You've desecrated a sacred place. The fairy ring. I tried to interrupt to say I hadn't meant to, but he shushed me and continued. It doesn't matter if you meant to or not. Those up ahead are the ones tasked with protecting this place. You must make it up to them, and there's only one way. I thought about his first words to me. My eyes. They want my eyes. No, no, no. Just one eye. You can pick. Like I said, just so long as one isn't notably better than the other. I tried to protest again, but he was already hopping away, his little fuzzy white tail, the last thing I saw before he disappeared into the shadows. Great, I said to myself when he was gone, just an eye, that's all. I made my way down the stone steps and deeper into the darkness. Fire sprouted from torches up ahead, leading me towards a raised platform where figures stood waiting for me. As I got closer, I saw what they were. Giant toads, each one as large as a Volkswagen beetle. Their eyes were strange and faceted like mosquitoes, dark and reflective as polished jewels, and staring intently at me as I approached. Their glaring eyes lacked any emotion. It was like a panel of judges. I realized as I marched into the midst of them. They looked at me coldly for several long minutes until I wondered if they were waiting for me to do something. They want your eye, I remember the rabbit saying. But that was insane. I wasn't going to give these monsters my eye. For what? For stepping on a few mushrooms? I scaffolded at them and turned it around as if to leave, but found myself face to face with cold, wet stone. The cave had shrunk and was now only this small room, just barely big enough for me and these five enormous toads who stared at me with blank eyes. What do you want from me? I asked, raising my voice to ask again when they didn't respond. Finally, one of them did something different. It glanced down at the cold stone floor of the cavern, and I followed its gaze to see a sharp rock like a broken piece of graphite. I found myself reaching down to pick it up. No, I can't, I said, but the longer we stood there, the more it became apparent that I would have to. The stink of the toads and the damp chill of the cavern became oppressive. If I wanted to leave, I would need to do what the rabbit said. Somehow, he had known. It was as if this was the way it was meant to be. Time passed. I debated and pleaded with them. I got down on my knees and cried, but they never blinked an eye. Finally, after what felt like hours inside that cave, I decided I had to do it. I realized there was no other way. My heart pounding with terror, I lifted a sharp stone to my left eye and watched it as the toads began to nod their oversized heads, their wide mouths stretching into wider grins. I dug the point of the stone into my eye socket 
and began to pray and twist, thrusting it deeper until my vision clouded with darkness and red. The pain was so bad I had to stop several times and felt my knees buckling as I almost passed it out from the agony. The slippery gore made it difficult to find purchase, but after several attempts I finally managed to leverage the eyeball from its socket. Twisting and digging, it came out the rest of the way and fell, dangling from the tendon like a tether, swaying and spinning as it hung from my ruined face. One of the toads snapped it out its tongue and grabbed hold of the eye, yanking it back towards itself and tearing the tendon in half in the process. The pain was terrible, somehow worse than anything yet. Gasping for breath, I dropped the blood slick stone to the floor of the cavern, bending over at the waist and trying to keep my lunch down. I felt queasy and sick about what I had just done. A terrible feeling welling up inside of me that I was now broken and had just lost some essential part of myself. Like when you lose an adult tooth or sever a finger with a table saw. I was not going to get that eye back, it was gone forever and was now being digested in the belly of a great meteorological toad. I blinked my one remaining eye and when I opened it again, I was standing back in the forest with my boot in a puddle of smashing mushroom, the fairy ring. I was standing half inside and half outside of it. I took my foot out of the circle, feeling the warmth of blood running down my face from my missing eye. Looking up at the sky, I saw it was clear and blue with no indication of the storm I had witnessed earlier. There was no more dark clouds, no more crashes of thunder. It was as if the whole thing had been a daydream, if not for the fact that I was missing an eye. I had no doubt that it was necessary for me to leave that place though. If I hadn't done what I did, the other world would not have let me leave. If not for the rabbit and his advice, I would have never escaped. I made my way back to the ranger station. This time the hill sloped upwards, just as expected. At the top there was a ridge with cliffs in the distance guiding my way back home. When I got back to the ranger station, there was only one little problem. My boss acted like I didn't exist. At first, I thought he was upset with me for some reason. I tried to talk to him calmly, but eventually resorted to yelling and screaming in his face. Nothing I did seemed to make a difference. It was like I was invisible to him. My other co-workers and my friends and family, none of them could see me anymore either. I've gone to see everyone I know and they all act like I'm a ghost like I never existed. My landlord moved my things out of my apartment and put new locks on the door. Ever since that trip to the fairy world, or whatever that place was, I'm invisible to everyone. I'm a ghost. I can still use my phone, at least until it gets shut off for non-payment, so I've been doing some research, only fairy rings in particular. From what I've learned, there are a lot of legends and myths surrounding them, but one caught my attention. Some say that if you wander into a fairy ring, you'll be transported to another world, and that you can only leave by giving up an eye to the guardians of that world. The guardians look like giant toads with the eyes of insects. Other legends say if you wander into a fairy ring, the magical creatures of the forest will trap you there or make you disappear so that no one can ever see you again. I think somehow I got the worst of both curses. I'm scared that this may never wear off. Whatever the spell is, it may be permanent. They want your eye, the rabbit had told me. Just one will suffice, but if one is better than the other, you'd best give them that one and not the other. 
My left eye had always been a little worse, but I was so used to it I'd forgotten. It completely slipped in my mind that my contact lens prescription was a little stronger on that side. I wonder if somehow the toads knew. I'm going back out to the forest to try to make another deal with them. I'll give them anything, even my other eye. I'd rather be blind than invisible. You have no idea what this is like. It's worse than death. I just hope I can find my way back to the fairy world and then back out of the forest again. I'm leaving now after typing this out. If you don't hear from me, you'll know where I am. I have a funny feeling that I'll be missing both my eyes pretty soon, but I'm okay with it. I have peace with nature, and nature has a piece of me.